First Church, my name is Summer Barcini and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am very excited to be able to welcome you this morning. Whether you are in one of our services in person or virtual, we are so happy that you have joined us. My wife and I have been coming here for about four years and I have been serving in some capacity for almost all four years as well. So we are very excited to have you here. Um, I love First Church because we stand by what we say, being an open place for all. And the six priorities that we have as a church in everything that we do. So thank you so much for being here this morning and have a wonderful day. Good morning indeed and welcome to First Church. My name is Katie Gilbert and I use she, her pronouns and I serve as the executive pastor here at First Church. I'd like to take just a moment to draw your attention to several of our announcements here. The first is that our labyrinth, which is an ancient spiritual practice, is now available for you to come and walk during our office hours or on a Sunday when you might be here for worship anyway. We invite you to visit our large dining room and to take just a moment to take a deep breath and to engage in this beautiful and wonderful practice that centers and helps draw the mind in close. We hope you'll join us. Our second announcement is that you have the opportunity this Easter to purchase a hydrangea in memory or in honor of someone you love. 
Each hydrang hydrangea costs $27.50 and will be available for you to take home after the service for you to plant or enjoy at home. You can find the uh, opportunity to purchase one of these hydrangeas under our coming up tab by clicking on that Easter hydrangea slide. Our next two announcements are about Saturday, April the 9th. The first is that we are hosting a church work day in the morning. From nine to noon, we invite you to come and help us as we prepare our youth room for kind of the final phase of its renovation. In addition, we're preparing for the Easter Sunday season. So we have a lot of things that need to be thrown out and gotten rid of. So we'll have two dumpsters on our property and everything ready to go. We just need extra hands to help make all of the work happen. So come and join us on Saturday, April 9th from nine to noon, even if you only have one hour to give. The second exciting announcement about Saturday, April 9th is our annual Easter egg hunt. You're invited to join us at four o'clock PM on the president's lawn out at Birmingham Southern College, where we'll have over 1500 Easter eggs for kids to hunt, bounce houses and steel city pops. Bring your friends, bring your neighbors, come and join us for a good time of fellowship together. Friends, with these announcements shared, I invite you to join me in our opening prayer. Holy One, lover of souls, we call out to you. You know our tears and our sorrows, and you bear the seeds of grief with us. Open us this day to your comfort that nurtures these seeds into sheaves of joy, the simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen.
Jesus speaks the words no one wanted to admit. He was not always going to be around. Oh, don't say that. So many of us have said that to a loved one who speaks the truth about the fragility of life. Perhaps we get uncomfortable because it reveals the precious nature of the present moment, laying bare the beauty and horror of it all. The indescribable pain we know we will one day face invades our senses like a pervasive perfume, inescapable. What if we stopped denying the limited nature of our lives and breathed in deeply the fragrance of vulnerability? Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharings of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Know that already God is offering us freedom from the need to avoid suffering at the cost of denying the fullness of life. We are invited into the knowledge that Christ's vulnerability in life, death, and resurrection shows us the sacred nature of the heights and depths of sorrow and joy in our own saga. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven, even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. God, we come recognizing that life is indeed fragile. We don't know when the next surprise will come around the corner at us. We don't know when life might be cut shorter than we had ever imagined. We don't know when something might change the way that we move through the world. And so God, we confess that this is scary and sometimes causes us to feel afraid. May we find peace. And so God, this morning we pray for many different situations that are happening in our world, in our community, and in our lives. God, we pray for countries that are at war, for the situation happening in Russia and Ukraine, for the refugees who continue to flee, seeking comfort and safety. Several months ago, they never imagined that this is what their life would look like this day in April. God, we pray for our country, for the division that continues to wreak havoc on the people we love. Several years ago, we didn't imagine that this is where we would be in 2022. May we find ways to cross that divide, to seek to be in community with one another. God, we pray for our community, for all that stands before us as a United Methodist denomination, for all that stands before us as a church, seeking to live out its mission and priorities today. God, we pray for those people in our community, for those who are facing difficult diagnosis, things that will alter and shift and change their world, things they didn't imagine to be true, maybe even yesterday. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would help them feel at peace as they move into a different phase of life. God, we pray for those who are experiencing any number of life changes that were unexpected, that maybe left them with dreams shattered, with a reality they didn't imagine or hope or wish for. God, we know that life is fragile. And sometimes we're reminded all too easily. May you help us to live in these good enough moments now so that we don't have to look back with regret. And God, when life is indeed so fragile that we just simply do not know what to pray, 
Remind us to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. Six days before the Passover ceremonies began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, where Lazarus was, the man he had brought back to life. A banquet was prepared in Jesus' honor, Martha served, and Lazarus sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a jar of costly perfume made from essence of nard and anointed Jesus' feet with it and wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who would betray him said, that perfume was worth a fortune. It should have been sold and money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, but he was in charge of the disciples' funds and often dipped into them for his own use. Jesus replied, let her alone. She did it in preparation for my burial. You can always help with the poor, but I won't be with you for very long. As we move into a time of offering, I pray that we would generously give. And as I sit here on the labyrinth, which is from our North Alabama conference office, you are invited here uh, anytime during working hours or on Sundays to come and walk the labyrinth and pray. And these are some breath prayers as we join it together in prayer. This is a breath prayer that we wrote for our city kids. Join me in praying. As I inhale, God guide me, O oh God. Exhale, my hope is in you. Inhale, Nothing can separate me. Exhale from your love. Inhale, I feel you in the wilderness. Exhale, I won't be afraid. Inhale, may my words and my heart. Exhale, be pleasing to you, O oh God. Inhale, my heart is glad. Exhale and my body can rest. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Jonathan Goss, and I use he, him pronouns, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Church. And it's so good to be with you all virtually this morning as we worship together and continue our Lenten sermon series, Good Enough. This morning, we will lean into the theme that we are fragile, that life is fragile, and that, that we, as we walk through and journey through and experience this life, that it is fragile that we experience the fragility of life. We're going to focus on that and we're going to name all of the things that make life fragile. Loss, grief, pain, relationships, jobs, families, all of those things play into how fragile life can be. And the only way I know how to handle a life that is fragile it's with care. We have to care for one another and we have to care for ourselves. And in caring for ourselves, we enable ourselves to care for others. The fragility of life can, can come at you in an instant. One minute life is normal. Life is easy. We're content. And then just like that, in a snap of a finger, everything can be turned upside down. From a phone call, an accident, a diagnosis, a loss, everything around you kind of just stops. And you realize in the shock of everything that, that things aren't right and that life is fragile. Years ago, in this space here at First Church, I received the phone call over four years ago. And it was from my father. And it was one of those phone calls that changed everything and helped me realize how fragile life is and how fragile I am and how fragile people I love are. In that phone call, my dad told me that his doctors had been doing a normal scan on him. He had not been feeling well and so he had been going to see doctors and one of these scans came back and his doctor told him he thought it might be a tumor. And it was. And nine months later, my father passed away from a very a rare and aggressive form of cancer. And in that nine month span, I thought about how fragile life was. I thought about how you know, my dad was my best man in my wedding. I thought about how my dad, you know, taught me how to throw a baseball and catch a baseball. My dad drove me everywhere and my friends everywhere, whether it would be, you know, to Six Flags in Georgia or to the local movie theater. My dad did so much for me and so much of his impact on my life has been good and positive and I miss that. But in that grief, in that lament, in all of the pain that I experienced through that season of life and beyond, it did teach me something that I still hold dearly today. And that is that life is fragile because we experience new life and rebirth and we experience loss and pain and death. And all of that is life. Jesus knew that he was not always going to be around. And he often spoke of leaving the disciples to go be with God. And many times he would draw a response from disciples along the lines of, don't say that, or what do you mean? Oh, don't say that, or what do you mean? It was exactly what I said to my dad on that phone call where everything changed in an instant. I had questions, I had statements about just life. I was angry, I lamented, but all of that, it changed me, it changed me. We ask those questions and we live in the anger or the lament and the pain. We do it because the fragility of life, it makes us uncomfortable, it makes us uneasy. 
And I kind of think that's the point of our gospel story that we heard this morning. Jesus with Mary and Lazarus and Martha, after a life-changing event that displayed just how fragile life can be. Perhaps we get uncomfortable because we are faced with that rawest and truest nature of life, and that is that life is fragile. Fragility reveals the precious nature of life and the present moment. I want you to think about that, the, the present moment. We, we're not good at being present. I'm not good at being present. Life moves fast, often too fast. And we constantly think about what's ahead, what lies ahead in the future. We plan and set goals and try to achieve those goals and move really fast. We move chaotic through life. Or we look back at maybe our failures, things we didn't achieve or accomplish, goals we missed. And we think, how could I have done that differently? Or maybe it's a relationship. How could I have done that better with that friendship? We look at those failures, those things we didn't achieve, and we live so much either in the past or in the future. Being present with life causes us to see all of life, all of that pain and all of that beauty. We will all face the pain of death and the and the ultimate fragility of life. And that is exactly what Mary experienced through her relationship with Lazarus and Lazarus's family and with Jesus. What if we stop denying the limited nature of our lives and perhaps breathe in a new fragrance? Maybe if we started to to be more present. Maybe if we started to be okay with the fragility of life, maybe if we let our guard down and were more open to being vulnerable, that we could truly live. After Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus experienced this life-changing event where Jesus raised Lazarus from the, de from the dead, this miracle that they all experienced, in which they lamented, in which they were angry, in which there was pain and mourning and grieving, and there was new life, and there was good. There was a gift in that. They sat down to have dinner together, and they could not deny the journey they had been on, the experiences they had had together. They couldn't deny it. They had to sit face to face over a meal and sit in the present moment, sit in the reality of that moment. And this act of love and anointing happens because they're present there together. Mary anoints Jesus' feet with an expensive and beautiful fragrance. Christian historian Bruce Chilton says this, Jesus may actually have learned the art and ritual of anointing from Mary Magdalene. He goes on to speculate that her struggles with demons may have brought her into the healing circles of which her region of Galilee was well known for. Anointing may have been a core piece of the healing arts with which she gifted Jesus, accounting for his increasing deliverance from the Nazareth path to which he was originally consecrated. When you are face to face with the fragility of life, you recognize the things that are important. The things that are not important fade away. You start to prioritize people, relationships. You prioritize those things that are important. The things that you should care about come into focus. And the goals at work that you might miss out on, that promotion, the hustle and bustle of getting your kids into all the right after-school programs or getting them into the right school. 
All of that fades away, and what comes into focus is what really matters. People, loved ones, relationships. And in that moment of realizing what really matters, Mary does this. She anoints Jesus' feet. And she wants to express her love through this anointing. For all we know, that's what real relationship looks like, what real love looks like. It changes an outcome and it creates new people, new relationships. Lazarus, Martha, Mary, and Jesus, they've been changed by this experience that they've had together. And whether or not Mary Magdalene and Jesus shared an outward ministry of anointing beyond this moment, inwardly their life together was a continual and mutual anointing. The act of anointing Jesus' feet was an outward sign of that inward love that they shared for one another. The sense of the fragility of life is never more present than when new life or when death comes to mind. We have all just lived through a pandemic and coming out of it in which everyone knows someone whose life was cut short by a virus. Most of us find ourselves, found ourselves asking the questions, you know, I've been thinking about so-and-so and you know, I need to call them. I just need to tell them how much they mean to me. I need to do that. Or we made plans that after this, after we live through this global pandemic, I'm going to reach out to them because they mean so much to me. And, I, and, and I've cared too much about the hustle and bustle of life. I've gotten so caught up in that going, going, that not spent enough time with them. I've not told them how much they mean to me. We've all done that. Perhaps this is why it feels like a good time to acknowledge the fragility of life and extend mercy to ourselves and to others. It is poignant that in this scene where Jesus reminds his disciples of how the precious time we have with one another takes place in the house of Lazarus, whose return to life must still feel so real to each of them. In this moment, in this home, over dinner, the disciples and Jesus and Martha and Mary and Lazarus, they cannot, they cannot forget how close death is. It must still be in the air. And Jesus reminds them that he too, he too will die. But it is this shared in the context of the promise of new life. And in that moment, Mary offers something new, a new scent, a new fragrance, a new teaching of how we can love one another through anointing. I think it's important for us to heed what is going on in this story. Mary, in front of the disciples, is vulnerable. She is accosted by Judas Iscariot. And Jesus says, no. This may be something new and different for you, but let her display her love in this way. She's vulnerable. He's vulnerable to open up to this anointing. So the question that we can ask ourselves is, can we be vulnerable in our worshiping communities? Can we share what really matters with one another in our faith communities where we believe, where we proclaim in this season, in the season of Lent, where we're walking and journeying through the wilderness, where it's dark, where we are experiencing pain, where we lament, but yet we cling and believe in the resurrection. 
I want to close with a story that is a little different from the story of Lazarus. It's different from a story of mourning or grief or lament. It's a story about a family here at First Church, the Castleberry family. John Andrew, Emily, and Poppy were expecting a new family member to join their family. But that came 83 days early. And so their new family member, Max, came into the world a little early, you would say. Max spent 55 days in the NICU. And in that season, the Castleberries, John Andrew and Emily and Poppy, they were all scared. They were all afraid. They were told over and over again that he wouldn't be released until his due date, which was March 15th. And so Max fought. He fought and he fought and he fought. And finally, Max was able to come home. Max and this the story of new life coming into the, our world and defying the odds of being born so prematurely, I can't help but, but see the Castleberry family as, as an offering of hope in our world because Max was so fragile. He came so early, and yet that new life fought. And he was showered with prayers and with love and support from doctors and nurses. And finally able to come home. We must be grateful for our fragile lives and give thanks each day. Facing up to the fragility of life, it, it can be scary. It causes us to be uncomfortable and uneasy, but it can also be empowering. It can help us hold on to the perspective that supports us living a life rich with positive experiences. And it can leave us, it can leave us with a conviction to make the most of our lives. It can leave us with a conviction to be present and to care about what we really should care about. So may we be grateful for our fragile lives and give thanks each day. May we make the most of our lives and the people we love. May we be ever present with them around a table as we share dinner and anointings with each other, for that's the good news. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in our affirmation of faith this morning, which is the statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
As we go now from this place, I invite you to hear these words and blessing as a benediction. Blessed are you, dear one. Doing the holy work of suffering what must be suffered, or grieving what has been lost, or knowing the unthinkable truth that must be known. This grief can make you feel on the other side of the glass from the world around you, a force field of different realities separating you. Yet blessed are you and yours, for yours is the one most seen by God who breathes compassion upon you even now, who has walked this path and who leans towards you, gathering you up in the arms of love. Rest now, dear one, you are not alone. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. Go in peace.